Welcome to Village Meadows. We're glad that you're here this morning. Thanks for coming to worship with us. If you're a regular attender, we're glad that you're here. If you're our guest, we're pleased to have you here. And if you're listening from home or some other place, we're glad that you're here too. So thanks for worshiping with us today. We um, uh, want to tell you that uh, we appreciate your being here. And if you happen to be our guest, we would love to have you tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, we in the chair back in front of you, there's a green card like this where you can do that. You can also give us your prayer requests. And we have uh, prayer groups that pray for those prayer requests each week. And if you're uh, watching from home or some other place, if you go to our website, villagemeadows.church, and scroll down just a ways, there's a, a place there for you to click on prayer, and you can uh, give us your prayer request that way. We would be happy to pray for you, and thank you for uh, participating with us. Are, are you happy that you're here today? Yeah. Ah, good. Okay, just checking. Ah, good. All right. So um, my name is Gail Tro. I'm the uh, small group pastor here at Village Meadows, and so you would probably expect me to mention something about small groups. You would, right? Okay. So, so we have small groups that are uh, participating uh, now. Some of them are meeting here on campus between our two services. Some are meeting in homes um, during during the week. Some are meeting online, and if if you're part of a small group, I hope that you will be a part of that. And if your group has not yet begun to meet, I hope that you'll begin thinking about how you might want to go about doing that. You can do it any one of those three ways, and I'm here to give you a hand to do that. If you're not part of a small group, a small group is the way that we grow and understand uh, what God wants for us. And it's the place where we get to ask questions. Pastor Mark usually doesn't encourage questions during his sermon, so... So this is the way, this is the place where you get to do that. And so if you're interested in being a part of one of these small groups, you can stop back at the small group central, the uh, connection point back here, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Or you can call the church office, and I will be happy to talk to you about the small groups that we have and which one you might be interested in. We're glad you're here today. We have this little short video that I would like for you to watch just for a second. So, once upon a time, there was a man who was leaving work and he was getting on the freeway to go home and his wife called him and said, Honey, please watch out. There's a madman on the freeway going the wrong way right now. And he goes, One madman? No, there's not one madman. All of them are going the wrong way right now. Thank you guys very much. You guys have a great day. God bless. Thank you, Zach. We appreciate that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings as we worship him today. Father in heaven, you are indeed a great and awesome God, one who has created this universe, one who has created us and you love us and you have created a way for us to become a part of your family as we accept your son as our personal savior. And Lord, we have come to worship you, the Lord, today. We have come to sing praises to you. We have come to listen as our pastor speaks words from you. And then, Father, as we leave and go our way to serve you and to be the face of Jesus to many people. So thank you, Father, for being with us as we worship you today. I pray that you will inhabit our praise. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ready, two, ready. <laughs> All right. I know you know these hymns. And I want to invite you to stand and sing with us this morning. We're going to start with our inner gates. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Oh, he 
has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. I heard, I heard an old, old story of a Savior coming from glory. How He gave His life on Calvary save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning then I repented of my sin and won the victory oh victory in Jesus my savior forever he sought me and he My love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and bought to me the victory Let's hear it, church, oh victory Oh victory in Jesus, my Savior forever He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood He loved me all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood what can wash away our sins nothing but the blood of jesus what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of jesus what can make me but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me bright as snow Oh, no other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood of Jesus Not a that I have done nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me bright as snow oh no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me bright as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus nothing but the blood of jesus y'all sound so good this morning this morning I'm doing seasons of prayer, and if you've been watching online, some of you are watching online currently or not, we have been expanding tech. Zach's been doing an awesome job, and as you can tell by the video, Zach's not here, so we need help, uh, and we need to recruit some people for our tech ministry as we continue to expand and think about expanding what we can do and the reach that we have online and our online presence as well. So if you know somebody that has tech skills or is capable or competent of learning, I, I just pray that you... Either you are encouraged to be a part of this ministry if you feel called, or you help prod your friend <laughs> to do it as well. This morning, I want to leave just a little bit of space for us to pray. Pray about that, but I want you to also think about what's on your heart this morning. And I'm going to leave just a little bit of space, and then I'm going to pray us out. So if you'll bow your head for a self-reflective time of prayer.
my soul. That wants, that's the prayer that I want. At the end of the day, every day, God, I want it to say, it's well with my soul. I pray for all the needs that our congregation holds, spoken and unspoken, on our prayer list and off. All the needs of the hearts that were expressed to you this morning during that time of reflection and prayer. I pray that you come down and comfort and meet us. Show us the God of love and mercy and grace. And also the God that challenges us to change. And challenges us to take one step closer. And I pray that you can help us do that as well this morning. God, I pray for our ministry as we're expanding. In particular, the technology side of it. Uh, the online, the streaming, God. You have a hand in all of this, God. And you know who has the skills and who can step up. And I pray that you build this ministry, God, because it truly is a ministry. And I thank you for those that are already on the tech ministry that have gone and done great work already. God, thank you for all that you have for us and all that you are doing for us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I want to continue our praise this morning. It's uh, an old worship song forever. Two, three, and... Thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand. With a mighty hand. And now stretched on. His love endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise, Sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever and ever. Forever. Sure. 
Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for um, allowing us to be in your house and allowing us to worship you, Lord. We don't deserve anything you have ever done for us in the through your grace and your mercy. Lord, please be with Pastor Mark this morning. Um, please speak through him. And uh, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and, and our minds to what he has to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jeff. Praise team. We've been mentioning along the way how uh, though the uh, conditions under which the COVID-19 is pressed in upon us that there's been uh, a ministry though that has not stopped. Uh, things continue to happen, uh, much of it out of sight uh, to us but still happening as you care for those around you. Um, but through the ministry of this church, opportunities present themselves. One such opportunity presented itself here recently in that a, a couple who had been visiting our church in the, in the wintertime went home, sold their place, and moved back here and um, um, came down with a, a, a U-Haul full of their belongings. Uh, in fact, there was uh, a 26-foot U-Haul, and uh, they had traveled a long way over many days. Uh, it was very hot, and they were very tired naturally, and so they contacted us and asked for help to unload that U-Haul trailer, and of course, uh, we agreed. So Pastor Zach, along with 18 youth and another adult, went to help unpack that U-Haul, and um, uh, and organized the, the, the belongings out of the Utah into the storage unit, and it took less than 30 minutes to do. Now, several of the youth uh, have done this and served in various ways over the last couple of years, uh, 10 plus times, but some of the youth on this particular uh, uh, event was the first time they'd served. But service and ministry continues. Uh, you were certainly faithful, I know, to pray for uh, Brian Clawson and Ed Jensen as they carried those much-needed uh, items up to the Navajo Nation. Uh, they did so on Friday, came back yesterday uh, successfully, so they certainly appreciate your prayers as, as well as we. So there might be something going on with the screen, I don't know. There was a picture of the youth that we're going to be shown. Uh, is it there? Oh, hallelujah, okay. I got nothing back here, so um, that's okay. I'll just preach by faith. <laughs> All right, that's a relief. So we're continuing in our series now through the book of Romans. Uh, we come now to the second half of Romans chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. Um, Paul has just finished instructing us on how we are to respond 
to government. And now he begins to address our duty with respect to our response to those that are around us. Now, when you talk about those that are around us, biblically, the term you want to use is neighbor. So with that in mind, um, let's take a look now at Romans 13, beginning in verse 8. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Now, prior to this passage, the apostle has instructed us to pay our obligations to government authorities, and he mentions two financial obligations, taxes and tolls, and then two what let's, we'll call social obligations, respect and honor. Now he says we should not owe anyone anything except to love one another. Now he's talking here about our financial indebtedness. That's what he's talking about. But he's using it as leverage. Specifically how fiscal debt drains us of resources. And I'm not talking about just financial. I'm talking about emotional and all that. But resources that could be better used in our love expressed to others, to one another. Now, you have to admit, for a pastor anyway, the temptation here is to launch into a mini-sermon within this sermon about the enormous relief that debt-free living brings. Uh, we believe in that around here, that we provide a, a teaching, if not once, twice a year, uh, through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. If you've taken part in that class, you know he famously teaches that we should live like nobody else now so that later on we can live like nobody else. He's talking about living in pursuit of becoming debt-free, which when compared to the average American household, nobody else is doing. <laughs> and then when you've achieved debt-free living later on, you'll be able to live like nobody else when you look at the vast majority of our neighbors who are still in debt up to their eyeballs. That's what he means by that. Now, what he's not encouraging us to live debt-free so that we can spend more on ourselves. That's not at all where he's going. He, Ramsey speaks in the same vein Paul is speaking of here in how debt-free living enables us to have actually more energy and clarity that is otherwise lost to the burden and the weight of indebtedness. Now, for us in the 21st century, the key word here is materialism. Materialism, which is today's idol that stealthily steals our freedom. I was reading this week about an account, it was actually recorded back in 1988, uh, when radio personality and author Dick Staub wrote, A recent experience showed me just how powerful the trend is toward materialism. My three-year-old daughter and I were leaving the record store when I, it tells you how old it is, <laughs> when I noticed she was carrying an unopened, unpurchased Sesame Street video cassette. In a firm voice, I said, Jessica, let's put that back where we found it. But I want it, Daddy. Ever wise, I said truthfully, but Daddy doesn't have enough money to buy it. Pleased with my loving management of another parental crisis, I was shocked by her reply. She gave me that patronizing look known to all parents of three-year-olds and said, Daddy, just charge it, silly. <laughs> I can see that very easily. It's in this context that Paul's arguments for loving one another has less to do with freedom from materialism and more to do with fulfillment of God's uh, law. In fact, as we were reading here, he cites a part of the Ten Commandments. Now, the believers in Rome, Gentile and Jew particularly, would be familiar with these commandments. They would have been teaching from the, the scriptures in that small group. And so they were certainly familiar with these commandments. And in, in the course of this, Paul is recalling the teaching of Jesus. When Jesus encountered uh, religious teachers and lawyers and informed them that the whole law was fulfilled in loving God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And in that, 
loving your neighbor as yourself. That teaching is found in Matthew 22, and it really has to do with the correlation between a love relationship with God and our ability to love our neighbors. Don't miss that connection. It's about how being a living sacrifice, yielded to God's leading every day, that we are empowered then to love others. Pastor Leith Anderson in his sermon, How to Treat People, observed that in western Colorado, there's a road called the Million Dollar Highway. He says, and I quote, My guess is that both tourists and even most of the people who live on the western slope don't know how this road got its name. They probably assume it got its name because it was expensive to build. That's not correct. Although it probably was expensive to build because it runs through very difficult terrain and at a high altitude. The real reason it's called the Million Dollar Highway is because waste material from the ore and gold mines was used as the bed for the highway. And not all the gold dust and nuggets were removed by the mining process available at that time. As a result, there's a partial roadbed of gold that is probably worth a lot more than a million dollars. <laughs> he concludes, it isn't the cost that gave it its name, but rather what's inside it. And then he adds that the same is true for the royal law of love, the love your neighbors as yourself. Surely it's costly, but what gives it its name is what it is made of. It's made up of God, and God is love. Loving your neighbor as yourself is to love anyone you encounter in the everyday traffic pattern of life. That's your neighbor. And you love them with the same love that you have encountered from God. That's how this works. The same love you've received from God, you are to love your neighbor. Now, much of what Paul teaches us here in Romans chapter 12 stems from this very fact. And the point here is that to love another is to love them as an expression of God's love resident in you. It, it's not merely being considerate or even generally kind. It's exhibiting something of substance, something golden, if you please. <laughs> Loving your neighbor as yourself is, is actually demonstrating that you genuinely care about them and their well-being. Now, let me just say that the world sees this command to love your neighbor as yourself through the lens of humanism, and naturally so. Love your neighbor, but only if you feel like it. It's nothing more than a good idea that sounds good. I like what author Bruce Larson wrote when he said, a friend of mine is a professor at an Ivy League school. He told me about a conversation he overheard. The head of the astronomy department was speaking to the dean of the divinity school. The astronomy professor said, now let's face it, in religion, what it all boils down to very simply is that you should love your neighbor as yourself. It's the golden rule, right? Yes, I suppose that's true, replied the dean of the divinity school. Just as in astronomy, it all boils down to one thing, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Love your neighbor as yourself is more than just a good idea. It's central to God's plan to reveal himself to a humanity that needs a savior. This is not just something he would like for us to be about doing. This something is actually how we reveal him to humanity. If you have the kind of Bible that gives footnotes, you'll see that the quote of love your neighbor as yourself originates in Leviticus 19, verse 18. Understand that in the context of the Old Testament, the idea of neighbor was exclusively to your fellow Israelite. But when Jesus cites this text in the Gospels, he broadens the understanding of neighbor to anyone at any time. Anyone at any time. And to make his point, he then shares the parable of the Good Samaritan, which he was directly specifically to the extent of our love for neighbor that it should go. 
to the extent it should go. How, how should I love my neighbor? He gives the parable of the Good Samaritan, gives all those enormous contrasts and uh, uh, unimaginable uh, story uh, to the mindset of the day. As we look closer at the partial list of the Ten Commandments that Paul gives us here, he gives us uh, in, in, in print four of the last five. And he throws any other you can think of about all commands. But the four of the last five, the reason he's wanting to do that or he's doing that is he wants to create a contrast between the prohibitions that are listed there, the do nots, and the character of love. For example, love does not condone adultery. Love is completely opposite murder. Love refuses to take someone else's possessions. In fact, love keeps you from enviously wanting what your neighbor has. Now, let's not miss the fact that each of these commandments address actions that are self-serving at the expense of the victim. You noticed that before? It's all about me. But love corrects all that. Which is precisely why Paul concludes love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. I like what the 20th century Bible scholar William Barclay said of love. More people have been brought into the church by the kindness of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments in the world. And more people have been driven from the church by the hardness and ugliness of so-called Christianity than by all the doubts in the world. See, people are one to Jesus because of his love flowing through us. They never seem to be interested in, in what we know, but rather they want to experience the fruit of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why our, our mission here at Village Meadows is to, to, to love those who are far from God into a love relationship with Jesus. Godly love actually proves we know Him. That's the only proof we have. It's a different kind of love, as you well know, if you've experienced Christ personally. Well, when we come to verses 11 through 14... It's as if the apostle pauses for a moment and more or less says, if you're not completely convinced you should obey these commands as to love your neighbor as yourself, then you ought to consider then the fact that Jesus could return at any moment. Let's read it. Verse 11. Besides this, since you know the time... It is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk with decency as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make plans to gratify the desires of the flesh. Now when you read this, you get a strong sense of urgency coming from Paul. He is addressing the fact that the clock is ticking, and at any moment the alarm could sound off. Now the alarm is not to wake us up from our stupor, but to announce the arrival of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so Paul, in this letter, is calling on every believer who reads it to understand that we are now, at this moment, closer to standing before God literally than when we accepted Him. We'll be closer to that when this sermon is through than when I started. Should He tarry in the meantime? There's a sense of urgency, and rightly so. Now, in these verses, Paul comes at us addressing two problems. There are those believers, and he's addressing believers here. There are believers who are indifferent, who are apathetic, 
They are content to simply sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, and remain disengaged from the unsaved. They are spiritually asleep. And Paul's telling them and us today that the time to be loving our neighbor is now. Not manana. Now, today, right now. So wake up. Wake up. The other problem he addresses is the need for some in the church to make a clear and decisive break from their sinful habits. Now, you might think that should be a no-brainer. I'm addressing the proverbial choir here. I understand that. There are certainly people online who would understand as well that, you know, if you're genuinely saved, you will have already broken ties with your, your sinful habits. But we know already ourselves, and we know that Paul has already taught us in this letter, that the battle with the old man, the battle with the fallen nature, the flesh, continues on. It won't stop until we come face to face with Jesus Christ on that day. By the way, this is the reason for the strong introduction to this section in Romans, which is, it begins in chapter 12 with practical living. And that's why he begins with, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you, strong word, strong, strong word, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Now we're in chapter 13, verse 13. We see he points out three sets of sins. The first set is referred to as, de or they're actually, they're, the three sets are referred to as deeds of darkness. They're categorized, all of them, as deeds of darkness. The first set is carousing and drunkenness. Historically speaking, he's likely referring to the wild and nighttime festivals in honor of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine. It would begin with a parade of drunken participants, and they'd make their way through the streets of Rome, and it would conclude with unfettered sexual encounters. I looked at that, and I, and I thought, well, you know, apparently there were those in Paul's time, like there are in our day, who will worship the lust of the flesh on Saturday night and come to church on Sunday and worship God. If you recall, back in chapter 6, Paul addressed those who thought that God's grace was licensed to sin without any accountability. I think he's revisiting that mindset here. The next pair of sins that Paul addresses is really a closely akin to the previous two. These are sexual impurity and promiscuity. But when you look at the Greek construct, he's referring more to sexual promiscuity, uh, but a bit more private. And I got thinking about that. You know, really, it's along the lines of what is pervasive in our culture today, and it's described as hooking up. And Paul is, is saying, stop living that way. Just stop living that way, and instead put on the armor of light. Walk with decency. He's saying, live in the light of the gospel, not in the darkness of sin. When we come to the next set, I have to say that we're all, I, I don't know of anybody who's not guilty of at least giving in somewhat to the temptation to qualify sinful behavior. We, we tend to want to qualify. We got the big ones and the little ones. Well, please understand that in God's sight, all sin is sin. It all breaks his heart. It all is culprit in severing our relationship with him. So Paul, to make sure that we don't want to quantify sin, he includes in these sexual, immoral uh, travesties the lustful gratification of quarreling and jealousy. Understand, quarreling and jealousy are also deeds of darkness. In fact, if you look at, the, you look at how the church functions and how it's laid out in the Scripture, you, uh, these two things, quarreling and jealousy, are the prime tools that Satan capitalizes on to break apart a church family and ruin the witness of that church. 
It's big stuff. It's not a little one versus no big one. All deeds of the darkness. Now with each of these sins, the apostle is challenging us to suppress them by putting on the armor of light. This would be tantamount to present yourself a living sacrifice. But he's, he's building a, a, a different mental picture, if you please. Now, now, many of you present and viewing online have served our country in uniform. Whether presently or in the past, you know full well what that uniform represents. That it represents the defense of a nation, and more specifically, the defense of the citizens of that nation. That when you view the rank on that uniform, it reminds you of the leadership responsibility entrusted to you. When you strap on that sidearm or hold that weapon, it reminds you that you are what stands between an enemy and the preservation of our freedom. And so Paul is using these words, armor of light, to specifically craft a mental image in the reader's mind. To see a uniform and understand what it represents. And in this instance, that uniform is the likeness of Christ. And what that image represents. He's calling for all believers to put on that uniform, to be image bearers of the one who saves and the one who gives life, a life that will never end. That's what he means. Put on the armor of light. In his astounding Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthews chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus begins that sermon with a series of blessings that he describes the cause and effect of. He then launches into his sermon with the declaration, you, pointing to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. When we seek for and fulfill the desires of the flesh, understand that we are doing nothing more than contributing to the darkness of our world. But when we choose to discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, we are being what Jesus has called for us to be. Salt and light. Image bearers. And it is to this end that Paul concludes with the instruction, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Understand that to put on something has to do with believing a certain way highlighted by your behavior. That's what it means to put on something. To believe a certain way highlighted by your behavior. Some people will put on airs to hide the real self. But to put on Jesus Christ is to display your true identity in him. Many Christian parents will counsel their child who is about to leave home with the words, Remember who you are and who you belong to. That's the wisest counsel a Christian parent can give to their Christian child who's about to go out on their own. Remember who you are and who you belong to. And that would be God's word to us from his word today as we go from this place shortly. Remember who you are and who you belong to. When Paul says, make no provision for the flesh... He's, of course, referring to our old nature, that old nature that still dogs us. It still woos us to satisfy its fleshly desires. And as one commentator puts it, although we are new creatures, our transformation is not yet complete. We have not entirely sloughed off the old self. So it is there to drag us back into sin if we heed its pleading for satisfaction. I think it's important to note that the word in the Greek for provision literally translates forethought or planning. As such, we can read the last part of verse 14 as make no forethought 
or do any planning for the flesh. Now what Paul's revealing to us here, and I, I suspect we already know this, is that sin often begins with a plan. Or at least a decision to leave the option open for sin. And what God is telling us through his apostles that since sin is so impulsive, we need to plan ahead to make sinning difficult. When I was a youth pastor in this town, four decades ago, a long time ago, a long time ago, I would tell my older teens who were starting to date that they should not wait to ask God for strength to avoid temptation after they crawled in the back seat of the car. And that may be a little too crude for some of you all, but that was the language in the 70s for sure. The point here is plan ahead. Plan ahead that you're not going to give in to temptation. Plan. Now, you personally know better than anyone else the areas where your flesh works the hardest to get you to cave. Let me encourage you right now to ask God for the wisdom and then the strength to put some obstacles in the way of that temptation. Uh, please understand that no one more than God wants to champion your ability to live victoriously. No one is more in your corner about your willingness and hopefulness of being an image bearer than God himself. Give him the opportunity to empower you by surrendering to him as a living sacrifice. Let me just say in the context of the, of the scripture we're looking at here, ask God to give you the, the strength and, and the want to to focus on loving your neighbor because quite frankly that really serves as a good preoccupation, preoccupation to focusing on yourself. Think about that. You're focusing on loving your neighbor you're preoccupied from focusing on yourself and hence caving into temptations. I want to leave you this morning with a, a powerful, what I see as a powerful illustration of how this love your neighbor thing works. It's reflected in a letter that was sent to the Stonebriar Community Church in Frisco, Texas, where Dr. Swindoll is pastor. And it reads... I'm sending this message to let you know how much members of your church have touched my life. Four years ago, my husband and I lived in a small two-bedroom apartment with our two small children when we were suddenly stunned, blessed, and challenged by the birth of identical triplet boys. Our whole family lived a thousand miles away and we had no help. Three weeks after they were born and the day after they came home from the hospital, I had to get a job. To pay for diapers and formula, I got a job waitressing at a restaurant near your church. I was still in immense pain and was truly frightened that this was more than my family could handle. On the first day at work, I waited on a group of people from your church. They were single adults. I had been a waitress in college and knew that Christians or people coming from church were not only horrible tippers, but also very difficult and rude. But I was pleasantly surprised. They noticed that I was a little slow, and instead of complaining, they were forgiving. They even asked about my life and learned about my situation with the triplets. This group continued to come in on Sundays, and I felt honored to serve them. They'd ask me about my children and encourage me in ways I needed. They lifted my spirits in ways I can't describe. It made me look at waitressing in a way of serving people for God. I'd say a prayer when I dropped off a plate of food or thought of a blessing to give them. I'd been feeling so confused about God and His plans. And then out of nowhere, this group of Christians entered my life in such a strange way. And they gave me comfort. Our first Christmas with the triplets was financially devastating. We were barely paying our bills. The group didn't come in to eat. To my disappointment, 
But they came in and left an envelope with a lot of money for me. I went shopping at Tours R Us that night on my way home from work and cried the entire time. I knew I was getting a lot of strange looks, but I didn't care. It has been years now since I've seen the singles group from Stonebriar. My husband was transferred back to Chicago and now makes enough money that I can stay at home with our children seven days a week. Things are much, much better now. That whole experience recently came to mind, and I wanted to let you know that something very special happened in my life to make me a Christian. I thank God for letting me serve this group. I want to challenge you this morning to put on Christ Jesus and then go out and find someone to love. Look for them. If you happen to be in a restaurant, tip well. And not on the basis of how they served you, but simply because you wanted to love on them. Let's pray. Father, we uh, are sobered by your word to us today. Uh, challenge is uh, too soft a word. And I pray as your Holy Spirit has been about doing only the work that he can do as your word goes forth. That we have allowed the truth of scripture to penetrate our hearts this morning. That we have, Lord, adopted a willingness to let you teach us and yes, convict us and change our, our minds. And Lord, I pray for those who are asleep, that they are well awake now. And for those that are still compromising they're determined now to rely on you and your strength to say no and to plan ahead. But Father, I thank you for the possibility to exist in those who have participated in this study today as they go forth. And as you no doubt in your sovereignty will orchestrate some divine appointments for us to exercise these things and express your love to those we encounter in the coming days. We thank you, Father, for being a part of all this. And it is by your will that we have arrived here together to study your word. Now may we, Father, respond to it in a way that will honor you and you alone. And for this I ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to do more than just think about has been saying to you, but talk to him about it. Pray to him. Ask him for his strength. Confess him. Rejoice in his faithfulness to forgive. A 
sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Sing the next verse. I praise. I praise you, Lord. And I lift my voice to honor you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King. sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Well, as our service is uh, drawing to a conclusion, let me thank you for being here today and uh, to uh, um, reiterate what Pastor Gail said earlier. There's that green card you can use to communicate to us your prayer requests or other information. Those of you online can certainly uh, go to our church website, villagemeadows.church, and find the uh, appropriate links there to notify us of your request uh, uh, and any other information you'd like to receive from us. Uh, today uh, marks the new day in terms of uh, how things are arranged in this building. Uh, we have moved the, the connection point over here against this wall and expanded its presentation. So Pastor Gail, I know, will be stationed there if you want to talk to him about the small group ministry or or other ministries we have that you might not be familiar with, but can uh, certainly become aware of them at that connection point table. So I encourage you to, uh, to do that. I want to remind you, or at least inform you, uh, that next Sunday will be uh, Graduate Sunday. And so uh, Pastor Zach will be leading that service and, and celebrating the, the, the many over the last year who have graduated from something. <laughs> typically uh, education. <laughs> so that'll be, that'll be next Sunday. I don't believe I'm forgetting anything else. So uh, thank you for being here today. Let me offer a prayer if you would stand and we'll, we'll be dismissed. Father, um, we, we thank you for blessing us and ordering our steps today to arrive at this place, uh, whether online or, or physically present. Lord, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to worship you and to express our love to you and to receive from you the truth of your word. We acknowledge, Father, that truth sets us free. And uh, may we embrace that by the strength of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us life, giving us hope, calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. May we now put on the armor of light and go love on people. For Jesus' sake and in his name I pray, amen.